right, our final storyteller of the evening is an Emmy-nominated writer, performer, and storyteller on NPR's Snap Judgment and uh, Marketplace. Um, he has a habit of talking his way into things and then improvising from there, which usually doesn't work, but it never stops him. <laughs> Everyone put your hands together for Doug Cordell. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the storytellers tonight. Keep it going for them, will you please? It's a lot of, it takes a lot of guts to do that. Get up here, I feel like I've learned so much tonight. Uh, uh, the Bulgarian word for shepherd's bitch, is that what it means, I don't? Uh, so, my story uh, crosses a couple of borders. One is between the known world and a famously imaginary one. And the other is between jobs I'm qualified for and ones I'm not remotely qualified for. Uh, for instance, writing for children's television. Because I didn't have children and I didn't have a television. <laughs> but I was deeply broke and desperately motivated and I talked my way into a job on something called the Book of Pooh. A kind of un <laughs> unfortunate name <laughs> for a, a show based on the charming tales of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and it was a 10 week contract, um, their option to renew. And it turned out to be the sweetest gig ever, right? The money was great, the women in the front office were beautiful, and there was a giant ceramic bowl in the kitchen that was continually replenished with peanut M&Ms by <laughs> mysterious elves. So, um, so all I had to do was come up with some stories. Uh, thinking, you know, it's a puppet show for four-year-olds. <laughs> I think I can do that. <laughs> so they give me a bunch of scripts to look through and kind of get familiar with the themes of the show. And uh, a couple of consistent themes emerge. One is, we're all special, <laughs> but no one's more special than anyone else. <laughs> and the other is, we're all different, which is what makes us all the same. <laughs> so figure, you know, take one of those, squeeze it into a three-act structure, throw in some balloons and maybe a puppet on skates, I don't know, and you're home free. And for those of you who don't know, a three-act structure is basically Goldilocks and the Three Bears, right? Too hot, too cold, just right. Uh, I just saved you $1,200 on a three-day screenwriting seminar <laughs> at a hotel by the airport, so you're welcome. Uh, a couple problems present themselves right away. One is the sort of unwritten rules of children's television. For instance, no bad modeling. You can't have a character stick their little mitt in a toaster oven and light up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> or bounce off a trampoline into the neighboring town, hilarious though that might be, because the little ones will try this at home. <laughs> also, no specific cultural references of any kind. Nothing recognizable of any known people or place <laughs> anywhere in the world. <laughs> because when this baby goes into foreign distribution, those may not play in, for instance, Hunan province. <laughs> the other problem is the world of poo itself. <laughs> I just like saying that. Uh, which seems, at first glance, like a kind of socialist paradise for bachelors. <laughs> because they don't have to work, all their needs are met, and they all have their own place. Because <laughs> like Piglet has a little tree trunk studio, <laughs> that would be like 1800 a month in Tracy. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, it's all men, interestingly, <laughs> except for Kanga. There's like a single mom on the outskirts of town somewhere. <laughs> we don't even know where she lives. She's like in a trailer, curlers in her hair, smoking cigarettes. Not making an issue about the paternity of little Rue. 
<laughs> because who is Rue's father? My money's on Piglet. Come on. Got that tree trunk studio. It's, like, um, it's got to be one of them. Because here's the thing about the Hundred Acre Wood. No one new ever comes in, and no one leaves. <laughs> Which makes coming up with like story idea number 114 is sort of challenging, right? You can't have like the smarter, better looking cousin puppet who shows up from out of town and hilarity ensues. You are stuck with those characters, and they are stuck with each other. It's a passive aggressive rabbit, <laughs> a neurotic pig, a depressive donkey, a tiger with, let's face it, developmental issues, <laughs> and a narcissistic bear with the situational ethics of a drug addict. <laughs> because who would sell his little best buddy Piglet into sex slavery for a paw full of honey? You know it, Piglet knows it. It's a kind of hell, the Hundred Acre Wood. And it's becoming a kind of hell for me at this point, too, because we're falling way behind production schedule, and the producer is running around making everybody's lives miserable. And meanwhile, none of my story pitches are making the cut, which isn't good, because my contract is coming up for renewal. I had won a kind of hide-and-go-seek game gone wrong that they said raised issues of abandonment. <laughs> and another where Eeyore suddenly loses his taste for thistles, his favorite food, which they said was simply disturbing. <laughs> also, by now, I'm not even sleeping Sunday night, knowing how much work I have to do come Monday morning when the wheel cranks up again. And I have to get in there and go over other people's stories, sit in on story meetings, come up with new pitches, bang out puppet dialogue. <laughs> and uh, so Sylvia, one of the other writers, gives me some ambient, a bunch of ambient. She tells me that she and her husband, who's like this overworked lawyer, take it to keep from being at each other's throats. <laughs> and she said, the only problem is by the middle of the next afternoon, it makes you kind of surly. <laughs> like you can eat glass, is how she put it. Um, so now I'm hunched over, banging out puppet dialogue, shoveling down Ambien and peanut M&Ms one afternoon when all of a sudden my back goes out, just completely out, so that I can't sit down anymore. I can't comb my hair, I can't tie my shoes. And from then on, I'm editing scripts and writing on the floor in the writer's room on my back. Um, among like pizza boxes and Nerf balls, all the other writers, these goofballs and trucker hats are stepping around me, and um, trying to come up with you know something magical. <laughs> and uh, I must have been delusional at that point because I pitched. I decided to inject a little politics into the show, <laughs> and I I pitched a story where Rabbit and Piglet run in competition for a sort of vaguely defined treasury position in the computer animated forest. And it all devolves into a mad scramble for power with the usual upshot about cooperation versus competition and a subliminal message for the kids about not letting hot button social issues distract you from your true class interests. <laughs> That's the one they went for. <laughs> they liked it. And uh, it was tremendous relief for me and, um, and a big deal, because now it's my first table read. Um, and that means that the, produ the producer and the puppeteers are gonna sit on these long tables on set at lunchtime, and everybody from the show is gonna be standing around these tables. All the women from the front office, the whole cast and crew, even the maintenance guys from downstairs. And it's a cold read, meaning that none of the puppeteers who are doing the voices have seen the script yet. And, uh, the producers only seem like a two sentence pitch. And the atmosphere is kind of tense because if it goes well, the producer will be happy. And if the producer's happy, everyone's happy. <laughs> and if it goes badly, it'll be bad for everyone. And 
It starts slowly, to be honest. The puppeteers are not really committing to my material, because I'm the new guy. And, uh, but then as it pr proceeds through, it gets a couple laughs, and then it gets a couple more laughs. And being the true hands that they are, they start to, they start to riff on the material and, and throw in some like corny ad libs and sexual double entendres in between the lines, <laughs> which is a good sign. That means they're having fun with the material. Um, it's not funny, but it's a good sign. <laughs> and it goes like that from beginning to end. It just percolates and builds all the way to the closing scene, which is a, a nice little wrap-up moment that's poignant without being sickening. And uh, they, hold, they pause for a second at the end, and then everyone erupts in applause, like all the puppeteers, the women from the front office, all the cast and crew, even the guys from maintenance, everybody is applauding wildly. It's a triumphant moment. Everyone except the producer. <laughs> and he's sitting there with a copy of the script on the table in front of him, and he's got a page circled in red. And he's hung up on a fairly major plot point that turns on Rabbit getting a pair of running shoes. And he says, uh, Rabbits don't wear shoes. <laughs> and the script boy is taking notes next to him, kind of chortles at that. And then a couple of people in the back of the room sort of laugh. And then a few more people laugh. And pretty soon the whole room is laughing. The producer's like, oh. <laughs> and, and then you hear this undercurrent of comments like, uh, yeah, that was kind of weird. I mean, that, <laughs> what was he thinking? Like, Rabbit. <laughs> Rabbit's not what you <laughs> And they're just laughing and laughing. And finally, I'm like, uh, excuse me, excuse me. And they go quiet, and everyone turns to me. And I'm like, um, he's wearing a vest. <laughs> <laughs> And the puppeteers shoot me these kind of searching looks like. <laughs> and the producer stands up and he tosses the script on the table and he says, the vest is part of his character. And he walks out. <laughs> and the script boy goes scurrying after him. And I have to sit there now with a room full of people all of whom had been applauding me wildly moments before, staring at me now with complete contempt, because this will not be good for anyone. That table read did not help me when it came time to renew my contract, and I was exiled from the Hundred Acre Wood. It turns out, you can leave after all. Uh. <laughs>